Hello, my name is Jane Gordon. I'm a jewelry designer and an artist, and I'm here showing my work on the ship. The first time I started showing on cruise ships, I, was, I, I got on not knowing what to expect, and I was told that my seminar was booked for the following day at 3 o'clock. Great, what's my seminar about? And I was told I should talk about my jewelry, which I had never done before. And not wanting to just give a sales pitch, I thought I'll talk a little bit about the inspiration behind my work. And in order to do that, I really should talk a little bit about my life, not too much, but just a little bit. Well, I didn't know what to expect, and I was very surprised in the end when everybody was crying and hugging each other. And you know, as you can imagine, being an artist in a uniform world, working on ships is a little bit challenging because there's a lot of rules and I'm not used to rules, but I, I kind of understand that there is one rule about not making the passengers cry. So what I'm gonna do is talk to you about art and inspiration and the inspiration behind my art and how I see the world without getting too personal. All of my life, I've been told that I'm weird. Well. I don't know, I don't feel weird. I don't think I look too weird, except sometimes in the morning. But it's sort of like you can be in your house and you can't see the wind or feel the wind, but you know it's rustling because you see the effects of the wind. You see it moving the trees and moving the grass. And likewise, I guess that's how I know I must be a little weird. I see what others don't see. I want what others don't want. Things that other people are passionate about leave me disinterested, and things that I just can't think enough about people find uninteresting. But of course, one benefit of going my own way is that I never get caught in traffic. So we're gonna ask a few questions. What is inspiration? What is art? What makes an artist an artist? Is art in all of us? Can your very lives be art? And how do we share beauty and inspiration? We're going to discuss why this is important for you, but first we're going to discuss me because I have the microphone. Thinking. Thinking changes nothing and at the same time changes everything. First thing we're going to do is redefine scars. When my nephew, my beautiful little nephew, was five years old, he had his baba bear and you all know what these baba bears are like. Absolutely no other bear will do. Well, David brought his bear to me and he pointed out earnestly all the places my brother Bill had sewn and darned him and patched him. And of course, Baba looked a lot worse than this guy, but I don't have a photo of Baba. And everywhere David pointed to the patches, he looked up at me and he explained, this is where I loved him too much. And this is where I loved him too much. And this is where I loved him too much. Can you ever look at scars the same way? If you have the courage to love yourself and be the person you want to be and struggle to be better when you fall short because we all fall short, then you have to love your scars. They're part of what brought you here today. If I could go back in time and change any of the pain and trauma that I ever went to, I wouldn't change anything because I might not be who I am today and I'm okay with who I am today. We're gonna redefine failure. Now, why would I talk about failure and show a picture of Thomas Edison, who had more than 2,000 patents in the US alone, and I don't know how many worldwide? Well, Edison was often asked about the process of his creating his most famous invention, the light bulb. I never failed once. I learned 99 ways not to make a light bulb. I never failed once, it just happened to be a 2,000 step process. He also said genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. We're gonna talk for a moment about being gifted. There's a reason artists are called gifted. These skills are gifts. The artist creates using the skill, but he doesn't create the skill. The skills pass through us until we're finished with our most prized possession, the body hosting the skills. Art is not a monologue, it's a conversation. We are dots on an infinite line, so ego cannot claim art. It does not begin or end with the artist. Without your participation as an artist creating your own life, reinterpreting and carrying the message forward to those you love, 
Without you, my art, all art, is lifeless, and lifeless is not art. I want to just talk for a moment about layers of discovery. Michelangelo, OK, very well-respected artist. I think no one can argue. And here you have something which on the surface is purely decorative. And then, of course, the next layer is that we're telling a story about the Bible. But Michelangelo also put a lot of humor and political satire into his paintings. Any of the politicians, businessmen, priests, cardinals who were supportive of Michelangelo got painted up in heaven with God and in very wonderful positions. That's why all the little cherubs have old man faces and little baby bodies. Now, in the final judgment, there was a character named Minos, master of hell. And in the most embarrassing situation, and Michelangelo on this character put the face of Biagio de Cessna, master of ceremonies to the Vatican, who was a thorn in Michelangelo's side and always harassed him about putting clothes on the people in his paintings, which Michelangelo thought was ridiculous. So that was his payback forever after to Biagio de Cessna. Here we have the opposite. Here we have something that looks very, very funny and silly, and it's got a very, very serious message. This man wants you to look at your most profound beliefs and question them. He's saying, well, how do we know God is a big, invisible white guy in the sky who knows if you've been naughty or nice? Because that sounds suspiciously like Santa Claus to me. He created the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Master Monster, also known as the Pastafarians. This is something funny with layers of discovery trying to get you to think. The power of words. I want you to think about how important words are. Not just the words you say out loud, but the words you say quietly in secret to yourself. The subconscious has no sense of humor. The words you say both to other people and to yourself are vitally important. Even if you make a joke about somebody and they know it's a joke, inside they feel a little bit down. I had a friend in high school named Mia, and she would always say to everybody, hello, gorgeous, and even though you knew she said that to everyone, you would feel just a little bit up when you saw her and she said it to you. So I want you to remember the power of words every day. Dr. Emoto has been researching for decades about how words affect water. Now, what he does is he puts words on a piece of paper around a glass of water and freezes the water, then photographs the ice crystals. And his theory is that if you put ugly words in your water, it won't form ice crystals, and beautiful words form beautiful crystals. Well, I was reading this, and I was rolling my eyes a little bit. This is what he says happens if you put the words, you make me sick. And these words stop me in my tracks, because in my search, to be happy, love and gratitude came to me as the most important words. And Dr. Emoto thinks that love and gratitude make the most beautiful crystals. This is my recipe. Look for the best in everybody and everything. Have gratitude for everything. And it's a pretty good recipe for happiness. When I was 14 years old, I got on a plane I, I, I took a train from my beautiful home in Philadelphia. I went to Newark, New Jersey. I got on an airplane, and I went to Puerto Rico without telling anybody. Some bad things happened. I was brought back, and I started a new school. And this is my high school diploma for that school. The high school diploma, the second thing it says, for coming a long way from Puerto Rico. And the picture here is a phoenix, because every year the phoenix dies in fire and is reborn. Well, this phoenix has turned out to be very prophetic in my life. When I started this school, the teachers had a teacher's meeting, as they did with all new students, to see what their goals for me were going to be. And they decided if they could get me to smile in four years, that would be an accomplishment. They took a vote, and no one thought they could get me to smile. They took a backup vote to see if they thought they could make eye contact with me, and they weren't too sure about that either. So the phoenix has turned out to be the story of my life, which every few years has fallen apart and become unrecognizable to what it was before. But these, these are oddly connected words. Crisis and opportunity. Sometimes I leave a piece of paper by the bed with a pen, and I wake up, and I've made notes during the night. 
And one of the things I wrote down was that the symbol for crisis and opportunity is the same. Now, I didn't happen to write a note to myself telling myself what language that was in, and I have never been able yet to find that symbol. I would like to make it into a piece of jewelry. But if you think about it, when you have a crisis, you have an opportunity to put things back together. Hertz and gifts shortly thereafter also became connected when I was trying to send a text message and it kept changing the word hurts into gifts. And again, I think every time things fall apart, the crisis part is not fun. The destructive phase is scary, but it gives you an opportunity to put things back together better. This, by the way, is a mask I found in Venice. I asked the artist what was the definition what was the symbolism? You can see it's a phoenix, the head of the phoenix above the head of the mask and a lot of pain in the human face and the message is, oh no, not another fire. Just in case you're tempted to feel sorry for me, I put these pictures in to remind myself to tell you because this is how I made that first group cry. All of this searching, all of this stumbling has led me into amazing adventures all of my life. Uh, this is Don King, this is Evander Holyfield. Uh, I have traveled around the world with rock and roll groups with the Earth, Wind and & Fire and the Rolling Stones. I've wound up uh, sitting with Winnie Mandela in her home in South Africa. Alfred Taubman, the self-made billionaire who sent me to prison for, uh, who, sent, who was sent to prison for price fixing the art world, sent me to Azerbaijan to work on a real estate deal with him. I worked for uh, Bernie Kornfeld. I've worked for and known so many amazing people in my life. And if I hadn't been a person who's searching, 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 then none of these things would have happened. This is me um, outside Saks Fifth Avenue in New York City where they were displaying my jewelry in their window announcing a show that I was doing. This is Maria Rainier Rilke, a poet who I have adored since I first read him in high school. And Rilke, although he lived in the time of Freud and his best friend was Salome who studied with Freud, he didn't want to be happy because he thought he might lose his poetry. Now the reason his name is Maria is because his mother named him after his dead sister who he would never know. And she dressed him up and made him pretend to be a girl. And if you can imagine if she put this much crazy on him in this way, how much more crazy she put on him. Well, like Rilke, I always love poetry. I'm not comparing the quality of my poetry to his, but I use poetry to quietly explain the painful world around me. And when I learned how to be happy, I, I did lose my poetry, but it didn't turn out to be such a bad thing because I didn't know that I was gonna ever be designing jewelry. And I can't design jewelry when I'm sad, and I can't write poetry when I'm happy. So my gift from all those years of writing poetry is to see, process, and express paths to success. For me, it was happiness, but success could be anything you define in words and three-dimensional objects. I call my work wearable poetry. My journey, darkness, scars, searching, stumbling, adventure, clarity, understanding, light, and repeat. Well, why do we repeat? Why do we need to learn things we already know? If life is not a straight line, how do we remind ourselves? Um, sorry, to go back and answer this question, my friend Jack Zufelt answered it best. He said, we can't expect to take a shower once and stay clean forever. So if life is not a straight line, how do we remind ourselves of the things we know we should know? Because at the very moment we need them is the moment we need reminding. Well, I don't think we can really carve it on a piece of marble and staple it to our heads. So what I do is I create beautiful objects that people are going to pick up just because they're beautiful, wear and keep with them because they're beautiful, because it enhances the physical beauty of a woman, but then they'll have them there when they need reminding or when somebody who you love is stumbling and needing reminding. This is a moment where a piece of jewelry can open a conversation very gently. So this is my work, beauty, inspiration, and joy. And these are the messages that I wanna share with you. The first step to happiness is freedom. When trappers wanna catch a monkey, they put a banana in a cage and the monkey squeezes his little hand through the bars of the cage. 
He can't get free because he won't drop the banana. Now, a lot of people say to me, oh, well, this certainly tells us about monkey intelligence, but I think it tells us about our own intelligence also. We hold on to pain and anger. We don't forgive and forget. We don't drop the banana. We don't let ourselves go free. So to get free in life and to get free of the necklace, you drop the banana. The little golden banana slips out of the monkey's arm and then out of his hand, and then the ring comes off his arm. His name is Dr. Man, and his first name is Hugh. Hugh Man. Freedom to me is nothing to hide and nothing to prove. I, I all my life have tried to do what I think is the right thing to do, and I've tried to just be myself. I don't need anybody else's approval, and I don't need to be secretive. This is a little smile face. You might remember him. On the back, I wanted to put a Nietzsche quote, but I couldn't even fit the word Nietzsche. In fact, I can't even spell the word Nietzsche. I have to look it up every day. Um, but this is the quote I wanted to write. The irrationality of a thing is no argument against its existence, but merely a condition of it. And I kept thinking, why do I love this quote so much? What does it mean? And I finally settled on this, okay to be. Freedom, it's okay to be your own crazy self, your own wonderful self, your own quirky self. Just be yourself. E.E. E. Cummings said, it takes courage to grow up and be, turn out to be who you really are. Lao Tzu, one of my favorite philosophers from over 5,000 years ago, said, when you are content to be simply yourself and don't compare or compete, everybody else will respect you. Well, I'm not sure if everybody will respect you, and I'm not even sure if I care if everyone respects me. I think I would think less of myself if some people did, but I like to think it's true anyway. You have to be yourself anyway. All the other people are taken. In this piece, I wanted to show a heart that's free. What is it that sets your heart free? In my mind is forgiveness. Sometimes the person you have to forgive is yourself. Forgiveness will always set our heart free. So we've got freedom, and the next step is gratitude. Here's the words, love and gratitude, and this collection is the bowls of overflowing diamonds. When I was a little kid, somebody gave me a dime. And I, I was so excited. I had that dime in my hand, and I was holding it so tight because I didn't want to lose it. I, I, I was so excited, and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my dime, my precious 10 cents that I had. And, and I was so excited to have it, a whole dime. And after a while, I lost it. I was looking everywhere for it. I couldn't imagine what happened to it. And it turned out I found it in my own sweaty little hand. I'd been holding it so tight that I didn't even feel it anymore. And I think that's what we all do with the blessings that we have around us. Either we are holding on to them so tightly, or we're looking at what we think we should have that we don't have. And gratitude enables us to fully experience and enjoy, enjoy the blessings in our lives. Um, the Bowl of Overflowing Diamonds came to me uh, in Palm Beach. In fact, Palm Beach is the nickname. I'd never seen more women with diamonds over 10 carats. And I'm not talking about earrings or engagement rings. I'm talking about tennis bracelets and necklaces and uh, so this is the bowl of overflowing diamonds. We have freedom. We have gratitude. Now we need faith. And I'm not talking about religion. Faith is however you interpret it. But we need faith in something. For me, it's faith in goodness and the energy and the power of the universe. In this piece, I have diamonds falling from a broken heart. And on the back, it says, lucky break. And this is me having faith that things are going to work out the way they're supposed to. We all know situations where maybe we lost a boyfriend or a job or we thought something was a disaster and we really were upset and bummed about it. And many, much later, we found out that, oh, it's a good thing that things didn't work out the way we wanted. Well, my philosophy is if we can have faith right at that moment, I'm not saying don't try to get what you want. Go out there work your tail off, try as hard as you can. When you're ready to give up, try some more. But if it's really not going to happen, that's the time to let go and have faith 
that this is happening for a reason and look around for the opportunity in the crisis. So we're building a foundation, freedom, gratitude, faith, and then you've got change. People are so afraid of change, but I think we should embrace change. And I make a lot of jewelry that's very, very changeable. Here we've got stacking rings you can wear in many different ways. This is only a few, and you can stack them with your own jewelry to get completely different looks. Um, here I have uh, pieces that clip on and off pearls and beads and stones. And I've got daisies where the center unscrews and you can put different color combinations together. There's the bowl, the same bowl that clips off the black tourmaline. The white pearl choker is actually a 48 inch strand of pearls that you can wear a dozen different ways. I, I've got customers that keep coming back and showing me new ways to wear them. And this again is just some variations of the same. And when you think about change, what is more changeable than water? Now again, we go back to Lao Tzu. In Taoism, they talk about water flowing down a mountain. And when the water comes to a rock, what does the water do? It moves. It goes around the rock. Well, which is stronger? Is the rock stronger because it holds its ground? Or is the water stronger, even though it has to go around? If you think about it, eventually the water wears the rock into pebbles and eventually into sand. The water takes its power from following the path of least resistance. Change is something to embrace and enjoy. Freedom, gratitude, faith, change, and illusion. Here you've got a horse, but if you look at it, it's actually in a heart shape. And the message is, what you look for is what surrounds you. On the back of the horse, it says, love is everywhere. I have this message also in palm trees, swans, and flowers. Wendell Berry said, the mind that is not baffled is not employed. Here, I wanted to show something that looks very, very light and delicate, but it's very solid. And the reminder is, we aren't very smart. If you keep your heart and your mind open, then the truth and light can come in. But we need this reminder because sometimes we think we're smarter than our core values. I always tell young people, define your core values, find the truth, and keep those as guideposts because when, you're think, when you think you're smarter than your core values, you aren't. Think about the things that we can be wrong about. We can be wrong about things that didn't happen yet, things that did happen, what is good or bad, science, people, truth, God. It goes on and on. How does this affect you? Mark Twain said, I've suffered through some terrible things in my life, a few of which actually happened. So this is the ruffle ring. I also have ruffle earrings. Even Socrates, who I think is pretty smart, said, if I know one thing, it's that I know nothing. Mark Twain also put it this way, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Or as I say, often wrong, never in doubt. Freedom, gratitude, faith, change, illusion, and now it's time to celebrate. These are the fireworks collection because life is a celebration. I will say also, there's another thing we have to ask ourselves. My father had a lot of really great, great qualities. He was very iconoclastic and very, very intelligent, but he was so selfish that he hurt so many people in his life. And when he died, nobody cried at his funeral. So when you're thinking of taking the easy way out, maybe ask yourself, do I want life to be a celebration or do I want my death to be a celebration? And then once you're celebrating, once you're out there doing the right thing, you're gonna see how this is gonna change your life. Because guess what? Only the people who celebrate get invited to the party. When I was almost 30, my youngest brother said to me, Jane, I don't understand you. You've been on your butt more times than anyone I've ever met. Why don't you play it safe? You just keep getting up and brushing yourself off and backing up and running harder and jumping higher. Why don't you play it safe? And I didn't have an answer for him at the time, but Michelangelo did. The greater danger lies not in setting your sights too high and falling short, but in setting them too low 
and achieving your mark. The star collection is a reminder always to reach for the stars. Sometimes reaching for the stars isn't as easy as you would think. I have the boxing gloves also in um, a pendant, and I gave this to my friend Nancy, who is fighting multiple my myeloma. And I just told her, Nancy, you just keep fighting. Well, talk about a strange lucky break. About a year before Nancy passed away, she told me, Jane, as painful as this has been, I wouldn't change it for anything. And it, I knew what she meant because as her body was deteriorating, her, her spirit became freer than I'd ever known her to be. She was able to grow so much through that illness and become so much more joyful even with the pain. And when she passed away, her daughter took me into her home and showed me a little shrine that she had with all her gurus and her um, things that she would meditate on. And right in the middle was the little boxing glove. Sadly, I've given away more than I've ever sold. And if you know someone who's ill, it might be a nice reminder for them to keep fighting. Freedom, gratitude, faith, change, illusion, celebrate. Now what? You have to give back. Horseshoes represent good luck, and these are overflowing with it. And this comes from an exercise that I do with myself when I think I'm having a bad day. I picture all the people in the world lined up from the luckiest to the unluckiest, and I think about I think about them standing on the lucky line, shifting their weight, and crossing their arms, and scratching their head. And I think about the people down in the wrong end of the lucky line, like in Somalia, incomprehensible. And I think about what I thought was giving me a bad day. Maybe I didn't do such great sales, or I missed a flight. And, and then, even when I had something really serious happen to me, I, I'd been assaulted, and I stopped to pull my car over to the side of the road in Palm Beach, and I looked at the sky and the sea and the palm trees, and I thought, really? I I'm going to let this get me down. I'm going to let that guy win. The only thing that's really hurt is my ego. So horseshoes represent good luck. And this says, lucky you, as a reminder. But it isn't enough just to use people in your mind to feel better about your life. If you really want to feel better and lift yourself, you go out and you find someone less lucky than you and help them. And if somebody lets you help them, don't look for thanks. You should actually thank them. Because being good and doing good has a power that will lift you. I read a quote once. It said, sometimes the good you do doesn't do you any good. It's very funny and rhymy, but it's not true. The good you do always does you good. This is the lucky you ring. I have a smaller version. Freedom, gratitude, faith, change, illusion. We're celebrating. We're giving back. And then there's oneness. This is inspired by the butterfly effect. The butterfly effect is a part of string theory. And I'm not saying I'm smart enough to understand string theory or quantum mechanics. But I understand this little concept. It's a mathematical model of the universe that shows we're so closely connected that if a butterfly flaps its wings in the Amazon, in as little as two weeks, the air current it creates can make a storm in Chicago. And I think if we're so connected physically, how connected are we spiritually? And this is a reminder for me. I have a little mini version of the necklace that I wear almost all the time. It's a reminder to always be careful and kind because everything resonates. Here you've got the earrings, the loop, is actually little tiny ripples, and the overflow is the abundance that comes back, which runs through my jewelry. When I was little, I felt like I was trapped inside my skin. I thought it was a dirty trick. How can I ever be close to someone if I'm in here and they're in there? I can only hope to ever get next to somebody. And we have a craving to be one with other people. That's why we form families, we get married, we have children, we have our families, we have our communities, our neighborhoods, our schools, teams, countries. The problem is with each oneness that we create, we also create otherness of the people that aren't in that. And I think that's a mistake. The less I am, the more I find myself. As I travel the world, and I'll tell you, I am as comfortable sitting with the most powerful, wealthiest people in the world as I am sitting on the street 
with the least powerful and the least wealthy. And the more I feel and experience the oneness, the more I feel myself dissolving into truth and light and the more myself I become. These little children are in Halong Bay in Vietnam. I took this picture. It looks like, don't they look adorable out there playing? Doesn't he look like the little Vietnamese Huckleberry, Huckleberry Finn? But they aren't playing, they're working. If you notice, their hands are turned upwards because they're working from early in the morning until late at night. And what happens is the handlers, I don't know who this is, if she's a mother or, or just an adult, I don't know, but they row these children out to the tender boats to beg for money all day long. And you can see these children have already seen way too much in their tender young lives. This adorable one was out selling peanuts in Cambodia. And this is Pat, who I also met working on this. She was working on the street in Cambodia. And I was really fortunate to meet Pat because she spoke English very well. Here she is later that day at the temple with all of her friends. And she couldn't ask me enough questions about my life. She wanted to know about New York and America and about me. And eventually she said to me, Jane, um, do you have a boyfriend? And I said, well, not at the moment, Pat. And she said, would you like me to introduce you to a nice Cambodian boy? Well, I asked her if she had a boyfriend. Now, if you think you're different from any of these little kids, let me tell you what her answer was. She said, no, Jane, I don't have a boyfriend. Um, I'm too young, but my parents told me if I stay in school and graduate, I'm allowed to choose my own boyfriend. I asked her what she was looking for. She thought about it for a while and she said, well, I want someone who's nice to me and fun to be with and has a good job. I told her we were looking for the same guy and she better hope she finds him first. And by the way, if any of you know him, send him over. Now, if we believe in oneness, then we have to take it a little bit further. Being one with beautiful, charming children around the world, that's easy. But again, I, as I said, if you have a core value, if you've hit on something true, then it's true even when you don't want it to be. This is the peace of heart. You see the peace symbol inside the heart and the overflowing diamonds. It says peace of heart inside. And now I want you to get still. You're not gonna like this next thought. I'll tell you, I didn't like it and I was the one that thought it. How do we find oneness with the worst people among us? I was thinking about this philosophy of oneness and watching a BBC, BBC program about child sacrifice in Uganda. And the way it works is if a businessman wants his business to be better and make more money, he goes to the witch doctor and he pays them to kidnap and murder a child as sacrifice to make their business better. I don't know which one is worse. It's horrific, it's incomprehensible. But if you believe in oneness, then you have to believe in oneness with the worst. So then I ask myself, who prays for the devil? And I'm thinking about the story from the Bible. Whether you believe this or not, let's just look at it as a story. And by the way, this is not devil worship. This is hyperbole. This is exaggerating to really understand a point. So I ask myself, who prays for the devil? Now the story goes that the devil used to be an angel up in heaven. So there he was hanging out with God and all the other angels and he's God's best friend. And one day he looks at God and he says, hey, listen, could we play fair? Could we just change places for a little while? Let you come here, me go up, let the glory come to me, let's just change places. And God says, oh no, you're down. And guess what? All your friends that are with you, they're down too. Now in the story, I believe Jesus says, we have to love our enemy as we love ourselves. So here I don't understand why we love everybody, but we other this one character. Who prays for the devil? Why can he be an angel and he doesn't get to have free will and, and choose good again? Now we're gonna take this out of theory and we're gonna take it into life and we're gonna take it into action. And I'm gonna show you why this is important for you, for your loved ones and for everyone. The idea is to pray for the devil in your own life. 
Again, for me, this was theory, and it's easy to have a theory, but it's hard to put it into practice. And I had a situation, it's actually ongoing, where I told the truth about a really bad man in order to protect somebody else. And this man was really angry at me, but he couldn't do anything against me because I told the truth. And in America, you're allowed to tell the truth about someone. What he did, he was determined to ruin me. So what he did was he framed me for something I didn't do. I didn't know anything about the framing while it was going on until he filed a lawsuit against me for this thing that I didn't do that he framed me for doing. And it was getting me down. It, it, other things were happening. I was having, you know, the usual struggles, financial and emotional and whatever the struggles were. And this was sort of feeling like the last straw and it was really getting me down. And I couldn't figure out why I wasn't able to be happy. Here I am talking about happiness, designing, philosophizing, creating art all about happiness, and none of my theories were working. So then on top of that, I felt like a fake. But what I eventually realized is that I was violating my core values of oneness. I was othering this guy. I never believed in evil until my 50s when I met this man. And here, I was just, I, I was so down. And what I realized is he started out an innocent little baby who wanted the same thing you and I want, who wanted love and acceptance and fun and joy. And someone did something to him to make him like that. And he will never know love because people will only love him if he lies to them. And I don't think he's capable anymore of feeling love or he wouldn't behave the way he does. And I actually stopped feeling sorry for myself and I started feeling sorry for him. And when I gave him my compassion, the strangest thing happened. It lifted me instantly. I was back to myself. I found myself again. So this is what we need to do. We need to pray for the devil in our own lives. We need to pray for the one across the white picket fence or the person in your workplace that's getting you down because they're standing in your way every day. We have to pray for the devil in our own lives. This is called peace to the world. I really believe if all of us have compassion for the people in our own lives who are the most difficult to feel compassion for, that it will resonate through the whole world. Imagine if people in the Middle East could have compassion for those they call their enemies. Imagine how that would change our world. I truly believe that we can get there. We can have peace in the world. It starts with me, it starts with you, with our compassion for the devil across the white picket fence. This is the peace, love, and abundance ring. The greatest gift you can give someone is to teach them how to be happy. The best way to teach is to lead by example. The best way to learn is to teach so you give yourself a way to teach yourself. Remember I told you about the bowl of diamonds and how it meant to me gratitude? One woman came to me she told me the reason she wanted that is that when she turned 50, she made a vow to give and give and give for the rest of her life, to give away everything she knew and learned and thought and caring and all, to give her love away until she was an empty vessel. And the bowl overflowing with diamonds represented that vow. Well, surprise, the more you give, the more you're going to have. If one of these reminders if, if one of these pieces of jewelry helps you to be the best of who you want to be, then perhaps you will share this art with somebody else. Share our messages with the people in your life who you love, either as a gift or as a reminder. When you're wearing this work, people will comment on it, and it's a very, very gentle way of opening the conversations you want to open. We're candles which have been lit by other candles, and we light others in return. None of us can claim the light as our own. As we light each other, we all enjoy the beauty of the ever-increasing light. So I invite you to be candles with me. A quick word about uh, my workmanship. Um, all of my work is handmade in New York City. I, I stand behind each and every piece. You have my address and phone number and contact information. If anything ever happens to a piece, if you lose one earring, if it gets smashed, you just come back to me. I stand behind my work. Um, the process, each piece of my jewelry involves about 
14 or 15 different, well, up to 14 or 15 different artisans. Um, the inspiration comes to me from somewhere. I draw and discuss with my model maker, Peter. He carves in wax. Sometimes he draws on a computer. When it's right, it goes to a mold maker, a model maker. My jeweler coordinates, assembles, polishes, and finds new artisans if we need them. One guy casts in gold, another in silver, another sets stones. Uh, one guy does a certain finish that we've worked on for years to develop. It's a silica blasting and an acid wash. If you look at my jewelry closely, you'll see each piece has two or three different finishes on it. Um, we're starting to uh, do gold and rhodium plating in order to offer much less expensive pieces. Uh, some of the hinges are handmade. Another person strings pearls, sometimes me. Um, Beth does wire work, and then it goes to you and then to yours. Uh, those in your life. Please come and join me in the, in the jewelry gallery to view my collection. If you see me around the ship, please feel free to stop and talk. I'd love to get to know all of you. And thank you for sharing your time to, with me and allowing me to share a little bit about the world as I see it. If I can touch someone and improve a moment or two of your life, then I am honored and humbled. Thank you very much.